Professor Andrew McLeod is a visiting professor at King's College London and has extensive experience in diplomatic and humanitarian fields. He joins us live now from London. Andrew, thank you very much for your time. You were a former aid My worker pleasure. yourself and you believe this problem runs a lot deeper. Why? It does indeed. This is the, the typical tip of the iceberg. It runs a lot deeper because since 1999, the National Crime Authority in Britain has been warning that as we crack down on predatory pedophiles in the developed world, those predatory pedophiles are now going to the developing world to get access to children. It's disgusting, but somehow perversely logical. The British crime authorities have also been warning since 1999 that their chosen methodology, the predatory pedophiles chosen methodology to get access to children in the developing world is to join a children's charity. Again, it's disgusting. But as we crack down on these crimes in Western countries, the predators are looking for more easy access. And the truth is, in disaster zones, in conflict zones where civil society is fractured and broken down like Haiti, where there are no functioning police forces and things like this, it's an open field for people of that sort of perverse and disgusting mentality. Now, once you've understood that warning has been there since 1999 and you start looking at the history of this, You've got the Bosnian whistleblower scandals, which was made into a film where 14 and 15 year old girls were trafficked for the use of UN staff. You've got the food for sex scandals in the late 1990s and the early 2000s, where World Food Programme people wouldn't register some children in refugee camps until they provided services. You've seen the peacekeeper scandals in Central African Republic and the Democratic Republic of Congo where, and I'm sorry to put this so bluntly to your viewers, an 11 year old girl said, I didn't have breasts yet and he still raped me. So this is something that's been going on for 30 years and the most senior people have known about it. And finally, we're starting to crack the mythology of goodness around the aid world. Now, there's something very important to note. Most aid workers are good people. A lot of very good work is done by people in the aid world. But these bad apples are destroying the reputation of the entire industry. And more importantly, the senior executives and the trustees and board members of these charities have not been taking all reasonable steps for prevention, detection and prosecution over the last 30 years. And let's dwell on that point for a moment. As you say, senior people, senior executives somehow covered up or didn't report properly on this, the scale of this issue. Why was it allowed to foster in this way? I think it's very complicated. In many ways, there are a lot of analogies with the Catholic Church. You know, it was very difficult for many Catholics to believe in the 1970s and 1980s that the church that they put so much belief and faith in and money into could possibly be doing these horrendous things and covering it up. And in the same way, there's a lot of people that have donated and given to the aid world, putting a lot of faith into the aid world. Many aid workers go into the aid world, putting faith and hope into the aid world, and they don't want to believe it either. So part of it is, I can't believe such rotten things would happen in such a good environment. That's stage one. Stage two then is senior people thinking to themselves, oh my God, if this got out in public, our funding will be threatened. So they try to cover it up. And that just makes it worse over the long term because when it does come up, the history is so long that so much faith is lost in the organisation. So it's a lot of complicated factors. But there's also another really, really sad one. There's a thing in the media called the doctrine of proximity. The things that are close to us matter a lot more than the things that are further apart. And I was asking a female journalist at The Independent here in the UK why she didn't think over the last 30 years it's got traction. Hate to put it in gender terms, but I'm glad that the journalist was a female. She said, I hate to say this, but it's perceived as happening to little black girls in Africa and people don't care. And it's until we actually realise that these horrendous crimes are happening to little black girls in Africa and they are happening to by peacekeeping soldiers, but they're also happening by white Anglo-Saxon aid workers. For years, the United Nations was nominally transparent about what peacekeeping soldiers were doing, but only last year, under pressure from the United Kingdom government, the Secretary General admitted at a high level meeting on the wings of the last General Assembly that the problem is not a problem just of peacekeeping. In fact, the problem is larger outside of peacekeeping, that is with the civilian aid workers, when we've finally got that admission from the Secretary General. Extraordinarily disturbing. All right, well, you're saying it's starting to get some traction. How is it getting traction? What more needs to be done? How is it going to be noticed? and more importantly, acted on at the highest level? I think they are very, very important questions. Let's go back to this Oxfam case, right? These are the facts that are known and agreed. 
This Oxfam country director had sex parties with multiple prostitutes and multiple participants multiple times. There is a question around whether the prostitutes were adults or children. Now, Oxfam have said they're taking this seriously and they've done all things they possibly can do, except this, they didn't report him to the police. In Haiti, prostitution is unlawful. So even if the prostitutes were adult, Oxfam should have taken their man to the police, not just allowed him to resign. They didn't fire him, they allowed him to resign and gave him a good reference. They should have taken him to the police. But if any of these prostitutes were children, Britain, Belgium, where this man comes from, Australia and similar countries all have what's called sex tourism laws where you're not allowed to have sex with a child under the age of 16 anywhere in the world. This man broke the law of his home country and has Oxfam given the dossier over to the prosecutors? No. The only charity that I know that has actually started to become active in handing dossiers over to the police for prosecution is Save the Children. And I've spoken over the last little while with both the CEO of Save the Children Australia, Paul Ronalds, and I know he takes this seriously. And I spoke last night to the CEO of Oxfam Australia, Helen Zoki, and I know she takes this seriously too. But if you want to know whether a charity takes this issue seriously or not, ask them, how many people have you sent to the police for prosecution? Because if the the answer is zero, then you're not taking it seriously. Should they have their money taken away, the uh, Oxfam, they've you know, got $50 million that is potentially at risk here? You know, there's a delicate thing that needs to be played here. You can't cut aid funding overall because then the people who suffer are the people in the world who really need it. And remembering most aid workers do a really good job. But can you cut the funding to an individual charity if it doesn't play ball? Absolutely you can. And I think as Oxfam crossed the line on this, yeah, I think they, they have and perhaps their funding should be diverted to one of the other charities. But it's really important here. This is not an excuse to attack foreign aid. This is an excuse to fix the problem of foreign aid. Now some on the left of politics are saying this is a right-wing conspiracy. And my response to them is, no, it's not. And if you want to defend foreign aid from a so-called right-wing conspiracy, there's a really easy way to do it. Stop child abuse and stop sex abuse. Good to have you on. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you very much.